Thank you so much. Boy. As you can see, I'm getting, I'm really getting old. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, so we're going to first start with the definition of recognition, right? Uh, before we talk about revenue recognition, uh, what do we mean by recognition in general, in the context of accounting, right? So recognition is a process of presenting an item in a financial statement, as opposed to no disclosure. If you remember when uh, in chapter two, uh, chapter three, when we're talking about the subsequent events periods, sometimes we had to do a financial statement adjustment. Other times we only disclose that information, right? So whenever you need to um, adjust the financial statement, that's called a recognition, right? Because you are presenting that item on the financial statement. Other times, because the uncertainty, you don't know how to measure, therefore you cannot recognize it. You have to disclose it, right? Recognition is the process of presenting an item in a financial statement, okay? The reason why there's a wide range of alternatives, okay? We have different alternatives, how to recognize revenue, okay? The reason for that is, okay, there's a long value creation process. Okay, what do I mean by value creation process? I'm gonna talk about in the next slide immediately, okay? So uh, revenue recognized earlier, reduce the quality of the information, right? So if I'm the tutor, my student paid me um, some money for, the, for next year's uh, service, okay? If I recognize this year, right? That's unfair because I'm recognizing the revenue too early. I haven't done the job yet, right? So then, you know, in my balance sheet, in my income statement, it shows a good number of revenue, right? But the investors should not believe the number because I'm recognizing the revenue too early, right? So the quality of the information um, is reduced because you are recognizing the revenue too early. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at, okay, so here the valuation, okay, the value creation process, the value creation process. Okay, there are still people coming. Okay. Um, so the value creation process, okay, so this is the typical uh, process. So you, you have a product, okay? You are able to provide a certain service, right? Okay, and then somebody uh, placed an order, okay? Either it's uh, maybe a furniture order. You need to uh, uh, manufacture furniture for a customer. And then you do the job, you manufacture furniture, right? You take some time, do the job, and you finish that furniture, okay? <coughs> then you deliver the furniture to the customer, okay? Depending uh, whether you are the, the sales, if it's all cash sales, that's good. You get all the cash right away. Most of the time, the furniture are too expensive, right? You probably will have some credit sales. It's gonna take you some time to collect that account receivable, right? Before you, you finish all the cash collection. And then there are some warranty period, right? Uh, certain products will have warranties. For example, electronics, right? Uh, if you buy electronics from Best Buy, in most of the cases, there's one year, right, assurance warranty for the product, right? That's the manufacturer warranty, right? So this is the typical type of uh, value creation process, okay? So the question is, uh, you know, um, at what point the revenue should be recognized, right? This is a long chain, right? So there's different alternatives. Recognize your revenue here, right? Maybe when you, are when you are manufacturing the product, you recognize revenue, you recognize it up on the delivery, you recognize it at the end of the expiry of the warranty, right? You can see there's lots of alternatives, right? In terms uh, how to recognize your revenue, at what point to recognize the sales revenue. Uh, this process is, um, it, it's flexible, right? You, depending on the business, right? So sometimes, sometimes um, you don't have a product or service. You first receive an order, okay? You first receive the order and then you invent the service, the good, right? So one good example would be 
customized housing, right? So if I want to build a house, right? But I don't want to just follow any floor plan. You know, I have my own design, right? So then I have to place order, right? And then they know how to build a house, right? They can't just build a house without my order. So you can see that this order is flexible, right? Depending on the business, okay? Uh, sometimes you have to prepay, right? In this model, uh, the, the product is delivered first prior to the cash collection. But you know, uh, you know in the uh, real estate market, right? Sometimes they would have sold, they would have pre-sales, right? Condo pre-sales. So they would, they would sell a condo to you, okay? Even before a condo is, is constructed, right? Pre-sale. So in that case, you first pay some kind of down payment, right? Okay, and then, then you receive the product. You get the condo unit, right? So you can see that um, really depending on the business, right? This the order does not necessarily to be this order, okay? Okay, so more people coming in. Okay. okay. Um, so the point is, you know, because of this long value creation process, the question is, at what point you, you could recognize the revenue, right, for the reporting entity, okay? There's different alternatives, right? Different alternatives along the timeline. More people coming, okay. Okay, so the accounting standard will help us to limit the kind of the uh, alternatives. Okay, we can use. So I first 15 is relevant to revenue recognition. Okay, I first 15, this is the uh, accounting standard. So basically it's issued in 2014. Okay, 2014, uh, it's fairly new, right? Uh, I first is still issuing new standards every year. Okay, so the revenue recognition is important. That's why this one was issued earlier, all right, back in 2014, okay? So this standard focused the term of contract, okay, contract. So it doesn't have to be a written contract, okay? So it could be written or verbal, or could be formal, all implied by customary business practice, okay? So in a textbook, they give you an example, right? Uh, think about the uh, you go to uh, you go to a superstore, right? You you purchase groceries. So before you enter into the uh, the the shopping zone, you have to write a contract with the uh, department with superstore's manager. Okay, do you do that? No, you don't do that, right? You don't have to sign on a paper copy saying that guess what? I'm coming to buy groceries, right? No, right. So this contract between the real uh, superstore and the uh, grocery shoppers is implied by the business practice. That's how this retail uh, business works, right? You don't have to first drop the contract, right? So this is implied. That's the idea, right? It does not, does not always have to be like written informal, like the legal terms, right? No, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, however, leasing contract, okay, is excluded, okay? So they have a, a, a different standard, IFRS 16, to deal with lease contract. So this is what happened is when you uh, rent a car, right? When you rent a car, uh, when a company, they lease uh, a vehicle, they lease a building, right? They have a contract. So those contracts are not subject to IFRS 15, it's dealt by IFRS 16, okay? Insurance contract, that's by IFRS 4, okay? Financial instruments, okay? We're gonna learn about it uh, in chapter six, I think. So that's IFRS 9, okay? So make sure that not, any, not all the contracts will be uh, subject to IFRS 15, okay? Okay, so. Okay. Um, so next, we talk about five steps for recogni revenue recognition, okay? Five steps, five 
five steps, okay? Remember this, five steps. Um, the first step is to identify the contract with customer, okay? So that's the first thing, right? There's a contract. Second, second, identify performance obligations, okay? So in the contract, for the reporting entity, what, is, what are the performance obligations I have for the customer, okay? Uh, let's just use me and you as example. Uh, so if I'm the reporting entity, you are my customers, right? Uh, so in, in my contract with university, okay, maybe university is the customer. Well, they have to define my performance obligation. So I need to show up every Thursday, right? <laughs> if I don't show up, I'm probably in trouble, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and then I need, a, I need to prepare the uh, midterm exams and uh, final exams and I need to mark them, right? And uh, I need to have, uh, I need to answer your questions, right? You can think about it. This is all my performance obligation within that one contract, right? So you have to identify, okay? What are the performance obligations? One, two, three, four, you know, the list can go on, go on, right? And then step three, you have to determine, this is about measurement, determine the transaction price. How much for this contract, okay? So how much university pay me for teaching you this semester? So that's, that is the transaction price, right? That is the transaction price for this contract. And then, and then for me to recognize these uh, uh, revenues, you need to allocate number four, step number four, you need to allocate this total price, okay? among the different performance obligations, okay? And number five is recognize revenue in accordance to performance, okay? So for me, um, if the performance obligation number one is uh, deliver the lectures throughout the semester, so I probably have to uh, recognize uh, this portion of the revenue over time, right? And then the second one is the marking the assignments. Again, I have to recognize it over the semester. Answering questions, I have to do this over the semester, right? So I need to recognize revenue over the semester, right? Re recognize my revenue over the semester. So that's the five step. Make sure you understand these five steps. So whenever you talk about the revenue recognition, you have to consider this five step. The first the two steps uh, is about the recognition. There is a contract how many performance obligations, okay? And then you're gonna do the measurement. What is the transaction price? How are you gonna allocate this price into the different performance obligations, okay? And then you have to understand what time, okay, at what time you are gonna recognize the revenue. So this is the framework, okay? So if you do not fully understand it, that's fine, I'm going to talk further in the, in the important steps, okay? I will give you more examples. Okay, let's use one example to check these five steps. So suppose a car dealership sells a car with a cost 25,000 for 28,000 in cash. The dealership sells the car for 28,000. 28, that car costs the dealership 25,000. And this sale does not involve any additional maintenance or warranty type service, okay? Okay, let's use the five step, okay? Let's use this five step. First step, is there a contract? Yes. Yes, right? So there's a written contract between the dealership and the buyer, right? You can just ask for it. They're gonna present that paper to you, right? There is a contract. Okay, next. Identify the performance obligation. The, what is the performance obligation of the dealership to you, to the customer? To give you the car? Deliver the, the car, deliver the car, right? Provide a functional car. Yeah, exactly. So basically, the performance obligation would be the delivery of the car by the dealership to the buyer. So the dealership has to hand, hand you with that key, right? And then you can, drive it away from the parking lot, right? So that's, 
that's the performance obligation, right? Yeah. Okay, and then number three, determine the transaction price. So what's yes. the transaction price? Twenty-five thousand. Twenty-five thousand. Twenty-five? Or sorry, twenty-eight thousand. Twenty-eight thousand. Okay, twenty-five is what they bought. Okay, you are not talking about the transactions with the uh, manufacturer, right? It's with the customer. So that's twenty-eight thousand. Okay. So now number four, you allocate the transaction price to performance obligations. How many performance obligations? One. How many? One. Only one, right? So that's easy, right? So now there's only one, there's only single performance obligations. Okay, so there's no allocations required, right? The last one, recognize income in accordance with performance. So at what point you are going to recognize the sales revenue from this car? Cash, $3,000. Uh, the exchange of cash. The exchange of cash. The cash? What if the uh, customer does not have enough cash to pay you? The, the, uh, the customer has to get loans, right? You know the car dealership? They give loans, right? So well, when, case, when there's a transaction. When the car exchange, like when they exchange the car. Okay. Yeah. Or whatever, whatever it is, be yeah. it a loan or cash or whatever. Okay, maybe it's a little bit earlier than that. So basically, whenever you fulfill your performance obligation, right? Once you fulfilled your performance obligation, you can recognize your revenue. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I have done my part. So I'm a, now I'm, uh, I have the contractual right to the payment, right? To the- So uh, the revenue has been earned at that time when you performed your obligation. Um, so basically, in this case, is when the car is delivered to the customer. If the car is delivered to the customer, the delivery has been done, then you can recognize the revenue. So if the customer drove the car away from the parking lot, you could rec recognize the sales revenue. Because the risk, the control has been transferred from the dealership to the customer. If just you know, uh, this is a bad example. If the, uh, the buyer um, got a car accident one block from the parking lot when he was leaving the parking lot, too bad. That's, that's the risk for the uh, buyer, right? Not for the car dealership. The moment you get the key, you drive it away, the car is yours. If you are in a car accident, uh, it's your risk. It's, it's, it's your problem, okay? So, as soon as the car is delivered to the customer, the company, the dealership, is able to recognize the sales revenue. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. Yeah. So, so um, what's the uh, accounting general entry is like? So up on the delivery of a car, what's the accounting general entry? Can anyone tell me? Suppose this is all credit sale. You debit accounts receivable. Yeah. And credit sales revenue. Credit sales revenue. Oops. Oh, I was. This is this is ruined the whole thing, boy. Ah. Okay. So so, so okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. So very good. Hello. Okay. Very good. Hello. So, but hello. don't forget the second part. Okay. Um. You so are. So you're gonna debit. You're gonna debit the account receivable, and then you credit. Uh, your inventory because your car is a part of your inventory, which is a which is a debit uh, entry. Yes. So you you have to take the car out of the inventory by crediting the inventory. Yes, very good. Thank you. So you have to recognize. Guess what? There is one less car in my parking lot, right? So my in inventory decreased. So you credit the inventory, and the cost is however you paid for purchasing the price, so twenty five thousand, and then you recognize the cost of goods sold, right? Twenty five thousand. So in the part one lyrics study, case study, a uh, lot of students, not a lot of students, I, rec I noticed some students, when they recognize the sales transactions, they forgot this part, okay? So they only recognize the sales revenue, but they forgot about the recognizing cost of goods sold and inventory, okay? So in the part one lyrics, when you are, rec when you are uh, making the general entry for the sales transaction, make sure you include inventory and the cost of goods sold, okay? That was 12 points, okay, for those three transactions.